Hey, our guest today is Adrian Trimble. I met Adrian several years ago. Um, actually, I was a fan of hers before I met her because her stance on human rights and the opportunity for minorities in business were so strong. So when she became president and CEO of NMSDC, which stands for the National Minority Supplier Development Councils, wow, was I thrilled to get to know her better. You're going to get to know her better as well. As a matter of fact, the work that many have done through NMSDC are represented by the awards you see behind me now. Each of these awards are the result of a relationship that my company has had with NMSDC, most recently being named the supplier at the fourth level for NMSDC. That's the largest supplier award that can be uh, one company can be honored with, and we won it in 2020. Now, let's talk about Adrian. Adrian is, as I mentioned, the president and CEO of the National Minority Supplier Development Council. Prior to that, she enjoyed a huge corporate career that culminated with her leading Toyota's uh, DE&I processes. She won many awards for them, worked with many well-known people and organizations, and led that company's rise on the Diversity Inc. Top 50 list from 42 to 29 in just to 25 in just two short years. Adrian's appointment uh, marks a significant milestone, though, in NMSDC's long and close relationship with Toyota. You see, she led their diversity spend from 2005 to 2012 and grew it to reflect a supplier base that increased it 300 percent. I'm talking about topping nearly three billion dollars in spend with diverse suppliers. So she came into NMSDC knowing her stuff and prepared to help others learn theirs. One of the things that I wanna share with you before she joins us is that she's also a graduate of Wilberforce University with a Bachelor of Science degree in organization management. She and her husband, Jamil, live in Texas. She has two beautiful adult daughters. And so grounding her faith, her knowledge, her experience, she's coming here today to share with us settle in and enjoy my conversation with someone who I have admired for a long time and now I'm very honored to consider a friend, Adrienne Tremble. Joining us right now is one of America's most successful female entrepreneurs. Special guest speaker today, the first African-American woman to own a billion dollar company. Her name is Janice Bryant Howroyd. She's the founder and CEO of Act One is one of the largest staffing companies in the United States. She's now ranked by Forbes as second wealthiest self-made African-American woman in America behind only Ms. Oprah Winfrey. And she spent almost 40 years helping others find work. Janice, great to have you on the show. Wonderful to be Thank here. Thank you so much Wonderful. for joining us. Janice, welcome to the And here she is. Wow, Adrian. Everybody's excited about this conversation. Just being able to talk with you on a on a one-on-one -on -one format. I mean, you've been on stage for so much of your career. Having you just sitting at home and sharing with us uh, your journey, your lessons that help us to improve our journey, this is such a gift. Then again, you've always been a giving person. Take us back to your childhood. Where did the giving start? So, well, thank you, first of all, for having me on. Uh, I have watched a number of your podcasts, and I know how engaging these are, and you do get to learn so much about different leaders that are in the community doing great things. So thank you for considering me as part of that, that leadership community. Um, for me, I was born and raised in a small suburb outside of Cleveland, Ohio, outside of Cleveland, Ohio in an area called Maple Heights. Um, at the time that I grew up in Maple Heights, it was a highly segregated uh, community where all of the Black families lived in one little neighborhood surrounded by um, more of a, you know, working class, middle, working class white uh, community. And our, I remember our, organ, our neighborhood was being bused to the um, other school districts for integration purposes. 
And so they broke our neighborhood up and kind of sent us in various ways to, to support the integration requirements of our, of our school system. And I'll tell you, this is probably when I first got my bug for wanting to represent those that are underrepresented or those that don't have a voice for themselves. Because I remember pulling up in a school bus that day um, when we first got to the new elementary school that we would be attending. How and old Jen, would you be, Adrian? How old would you I be? I was 10 years old. I was in the wow. fifth grade, 10 wow. years old. And I guess a number of the students had heard that we were coming and we got through the first day, but when we got on the bus to leave, all of these students came from nowhere. They were throwing rocks at our bus, calling us the N-word, telling us not to come back. And I remember looking out the window, and it feels like yesterday, I remember looking out the window asking, how can these people hate us so much and they don't even know us? All because of the color of our skin. And to me, you know, I can reflect on this years later, that behavior was learned. These were just kids. So they didn't know any better. This was, this behavior was being taught to them in their homes. It was being taught to them by people who held professional positions that had to interact with people from all walks of life, whether they were teachers or doctors or lawyers or, or business owners. They, you know, the world was much bigger than what was represented just by though that community. And I could see then, and I could reflect on it later that there was a lot of work to be done to help people understand that we have more in common than we have different from each other. So that kind of helped me on my journey as I started thinking about what I wanted to do with my life. At that time, going through high school and even going into college, I always thought I would be a civil rights attorney. That's kind of what I was thinking that I would end up doing. Again, being that voice for, the, for someone who's not been heard or the voiceless or those who are underserved. But I found a way to be able to accomplish the same thing just doing it inside corporate America. Well, I have to say you've done it splendidly. I mean, your reputation well preceded you before you even reached NMSDC. And uh, as our fearless leader, um, <laughs> you know, when you think about growing up um, and growing up in the heartland of America, uh, experiencing that, you didn't leave that with a heart of bitterness, nor did you leave it with a lack of belief in your own ability to achieve. What was the deciding factor that helped you, not so much to set you apart from others who grew up like you, rather to make you the very special, successful human being who still has a heart for giving and a heart of, um, for unity? It was my mother. My mother raised three girls as a single parent by herself, um, working to take care of us the best that she could um, with limited resources. And it took a village that she had to depend on, you know, her sisters, neighbors, others to kind of help with, with, with us. And for me, I remember saying, just hearing her, watching how hard she worked, Janice. She worked extremely hard. Um, and that work ethic was, was kind of instilled in us as, as her daughters. And she always told us that we could do whatever we wanted to do if we just worked hard to achieve it. And that we were no less than anyone else, no matter what those kids at school were trying to tell us, we were no less than anyone else. And I remember I was talking to her one day, I don't know if you remember, I'm dating myself here, but remember that television show that was called uh, Hotel at the time? It was a yes. show that came out. So we were watching that show one day and I was just so enthralled with these, this beautiful resort. And I said, you know, I would love to work at a hotel one day. And she said, well, why wouldn't you just own the hotel? And to me, I was thinking, you know, it never, you know, that's the kind of behaviors and the type of, of thought that we have to put into the next generation that we can be owners and not just consumers. And to me, that was such a foreign thought, but that's how she pushed me. So when I think about what has really driven me, it's always been my mother kind of raising that bar saying, but you can do so much more. And then once you become, once you start doing more, then it's to whom much is given, much is required. So you have to pay it back. You have to pay it forward. So that's kind of the, the thought process that's, that I just live by because that's, that's what was instilled in me at a very young age. Well, while have you honored her in how you not only achieve 
uh, for yourself, but especially for so many others. And we're going to talk about that. One of the things I have to say, though, uh, and I know all of our family are witnessing that right now, Adrian, you know, you're very well known for not just your expertise and your voice for others, but you also bring a certain carriage and an elegance to what you do. Was that an influence from those women who you just mentioned being a part of your upbringing, your mom and your aunts? Well, there was some of that. They, they had their own sense of glamour back then. Uh, when I think about the big afros they wore and the platform boots, it was always kind of stylish. But really, I didn't really get that sense until I left Cleveland when I went to the University of Cincinnati, um, enrolled in school there. And I saw a whole different lifestyle when I started working in corporate America that, you know, the professional, you know, you wear the suits and and you, you, you show up and you show up with presence so that your voice can be heard before you even walk in the room. So there were others that I would just see that had that kind of style about them. And I knew that it became kind of the uniform almost that you have to show up and represent those who you are representing, right? So it just became a part of who I was as I watched folks in corporate America really see them on their traje trajectory and how they were able to influence and negotiate and that confidence that it gives you when you walk in and you know that you belong at that table. Well, I can tell you many women who are uh, members and attendees of NMSDC events uh, have commented out of your earshot that they would love you to give lessons on that. So now, oh my that, goodness. Look, look, now that we're all home, maybe you can do a Zoom. Maybe I can host you to a Zoom to just kind of teach some of us how we create that because, you know, it's not just about what you're wearing. I think so much that they are attracted to you as am I. I think it's how you wear it. I mean, you bring, you do bring an elegance. You bring an attention to, um, to the details I think that matter. I've noticed that uh, simplicity with a sparkle is kind of how I would describe your style. You don't over fluff it. Uh, that's also, to me, what I get from your lessons and your teachings as you're leading us on how to build better businesses, how to make connections with corporate America if we are minority business owners, and how to communicate with each other. Um, yeah, I think simplicity with sparkle kind of is how I would describe you. How do you describe yourself? You know, Janice, I'm only 5'2". So and people, people know that I'm always in heels. So I'm always in heels because I'm only 5'2". <laughs> so I, I, actually, when you coined that, when you said that the simplicity with the sparkle, I would say that's it. You know, I do believe in, you know, simplicity and just being, you know, and having great accessories to kind of bring out the outfit, to complement the outfit, to complement your personality. So, you know, for me, it is pretty much around that, that just that simplicity of it. And then what can really add to it because you don't want to be so loud that you walk into a room that that's what people see and what they focus on. You want them to focus right. on what you have to say and what you're bringing to the table from a thought leadership perspective and not just about the flashiness of your attire. Yeah, you wear it, it doesn't wear you. Exactly, yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 and how you teach us, how you support us, I think is such a strong, strong uh, alignment with that philosophy. Um, I remember listening to you once talking to a group and you said, at the end of the day, you've got to be able to back up everything you say about yourself but people are gonna listen more to what other people are saying about you. And I may power quote you, but I took that out of there and I watched the people around me listening to you. And I noticed a couple of people changing their pitches before they were going into those meetings after you said that. That seemed to come more from a place of experience than a place of academic learning for, for you. Has that been your own experience in your career, having been um, a career professional versus entrepreneur in the typical sense of one? Absolutely, Janice. And, and one of the things that I think people don't realize is the conversation that goes on after you've left the room. And when you don't have champions or advocates in that room, your job becomes even that much more difficult. And my career started in human resources. So many times I would be in the room having in those conversations 
And it's why I fought so hard to make sure I was in the room and being a part of those conversations because I wanted to make sure that there was someone else in there that was advocating for those who were not represented. So I would hear the conversations of what someone would say. You, someone could come in, whether it was for a position that they were interviewing for, or even when I moved into supplier diversity for someone that was pitching their business. They would pitch their business and get, or pitch their position in terms of their experiences for a role, hear all this great feedback. Oh, that's great. Oh, we, that sounds really good. All this positive feedback. They would walk out in the room and then you would hear the, yeah, but. Yeah, they don't have this or yeah, that. So there's a whole different conversation that goes on once you leave. So that's why I started thinking that people need to understand that. Don't just go in and try to present what you think they need to hear. You need to know what, what problem they're trying to solve, what value you're bringing and how you're able to help that company move forward, whether it's from a, a, a human resources perspective or from a business perspective. Because if you don't, then they won't have anything to advocate for on your behalf once you leave the room. Well, you talk a lot about advocacy and you live a lot about advocacy. The fact that you could choose anything you want to do in your life, and let's be honest, you've earned the right to do that. You certainly have that right differently than many. And yet you chose to take on the leadership of one of the motherships for uh, DE&I. Uh, and if it's in the US, basically it's speaking to the world. How did you come to that decision? I mean, you had to give up a lot to do this. I did, I did. But I'll tell you, um, I, I've always been very supportive of NMSDC over the years. When I look at the legacy that Harriet Michelle built, first of all, I thought that her, her leadership was just second to none. Um, she could go toe to toe with anyone in any room on any topic. So my yes, admiration for her is high. <laughs> Um, and I saw the organization, the legacy that she built, and then I saw the, the transition that NMSDC was going through over the years after she retired. And I felt if I could bring anything to help restore the organization back to the forefront of leadership of advocacy for minority businesses, it was almost like a calling for me. So as I was sitting in corporate America and still enjoying my role leading diversity and inclusion for one of the largest companies in the world, um, thinking, okay, if this is something that could, my talents could be used to help others, because when you think about minority business development and the impact that it has on our communities, it goes far beyond just your traditional diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies, right? This is life changing. This is about generation, wealth generation building and what we do for generations to come for sustainability and the impact it has on the economy. I mean, it's just a much bigger implication than just your traditional diversity, equity, and inclusion. So for me, I thought if I could be a part of that solution and help solve that problem, not even knowing what was going to come in 2020, who knew that was going to come? But if I could be a part of that, then I would, I'm happy to, I'm happy to serve. So for oh, me, that's what it was about. You, you know, Adrian, um, you mentioned, and I think rightfully so, I know rightfully so, the impact that Harriet's leadership uh, has had on NMSDC and on communities at large. One of the things that she was a clarion for, and I see you do that as well, is not just the impact for minority communities, but the impact for the corporate community mm -hmm. and good business itself. What is it that people need to understand about diversity and inclusion in a supplier base um, and its impact on the business community and enterprises at large? So let's face it, when you think about the supply chain overall, and this was the lesson learned in 2020, right? Prior to 2020, a number of corporations had outsourced so much of their supply chain globally, right? And they really were focusing on global solutions. And when we had the major disruption to the supply chain in 2020 due to COVID or other, you know, other issues that started impacting our economy here, they had to bring, they had to find solutions right here in the US. So they had to turn to the, the, same, the same supply base that they had kind of shut out over the years because they were looking at these global solutions or looking at much larger solutions as they consolidated supply, their supply base and things of that nature. 
So when you start thinking about the implications to the U.S. economy, let's take a step back and look at what the data is telling us. The U.S. Census has already told us that the, the U.S. economy, the U.S. demographic is going to change. The minority will become the majority. So we know that that's going to happen. Who is going to be the entrepreneur of the future? Who's going to be the consumer of the future? Who's going to be your workforce of the future? So all of this is telling us, we have the indicators to understand what that means now today. The, the question is, how do you begin to prepare for it? How does corporate America begin to prepare for that? You can't wait to 10, 15, 20 years out. You need to start cultivating that innovation with these most nimble suppliers that are out there that just happen to be diverse. And that was my whole thing is that you're looking at a supply base and what, what's available to you right here in the U.S. that can bring you solutions very quickly, nimbly. They, they, they're not, not as bureaucratic as some of your larger organizations. Why would you not want to tap into this, which, who, by the way, just happened to represent the diversity of what this, com of what this country will look like in 10, 15, 20 years out and what, this, what our consumer base will look like. So trying to help them understand it from that perspective is kind of, that's when the aha went off. And I don't think people saw it until 2020 happened and we all of a sudden saw the, the heavy reliance upon this on the, on the supply base. Adrian, that's so important. You know, uh, the majority of our family, our listening uh, community are 35 years and under. Um, many of them are college students. Most of them are young professionals. Um, provide a link to them right now. And we're certainly gonna mention that uh, at the finish of this conversation, we'll show them, uh, but provide a link right now if people want to be able to talk uh, with NMSDC in a way that helps them to understand the value you bring for those young entrepreneurs. Where do they go to visit the website? Sure, so they can start by visiting nmsdc.org. What's also helpful is that when you go to our main website, you can also get connected to one of our 23 affiliate councils that are spread out across the country so that you can have a more direct relationship with the council that's right within your, your region, which could be very helpful for those local connections that can be made for the local suppliers and local corporations. So that's also located on our website as well. And you guys do such, I say you guys, I feel as though I should say we, because I feel we. such a part of NMSDC. By the way, you see all of these awards back I'm here. looking, yes. I mentioned, I mentioned in the introduction that every award they're looking at is the result of a relationship with NMSDC. And they're right. not just awards for the sake of honoring stuff. They actually represent uh, commerce. They represent mm -hmm. business. They represent dollars. I mean, the impact that NMSDC is having for diverse suppliers is huge. And the preparation for suppliers, as you mentioned earlier, to come into an environment like we've never seen before. And still many of your suppliers are continuing to do business because of what they've learned through the organization or connections they've made. Can you just talk a little bit about the business of NMSDC and why I'm so enthusiastic about it? So NMSDC, it's the organization has been around since 1972. And I don't think people realize that the organization was actually created by chief procurement officers of Fortune 50 companies who said they wanted a way to reach the minority supply base and minority entrepreneur. And a lot of that came from the work that was being done in the automotive industry by companies such as Ford, General Motors, Chrysler, because they understood it, they got it. They understood who was actually buying their product and they knew that they needed that direct link back to the consumer which comes through minority business development. So for us, it's about how do you cultivate those relationships and those connections so that corporate America knows about our minority businesses, understands their capability, understands the impact of doing business with minority entrepreneurs and understands the way that it can help their business grow and evolve and solve solutions within their supply chain. So we focus a lot around those connection pieces, whether those are through our conferences where you have our trade shows, whether it's through our matchmakers where we have the ability for our, our corporations to say, these are the specific areas that we are sourcing for, that we're looking to bring in new suppliers for. 
and then they get the opportunity to see what the capabilities are and, and what our minority businesses can actually bring to the table to address some of their, their, their needs in the supply chain. Connection is so important because Janice, we all know, people do business with those that they know, like, and trust. So we have to make sure that we are facilitating the connection of our corporate members with our MBEs. The second piece of it is really around the development activity, making sure that our MBEs are positioned with stronger capabilities, stronger capacity building, understanding again, how do they pitch to these corporate corporations so that they can get the attention and get the, the, the response back to their, their proposals, giving them all the tools and resources that they need to be successful when they go after these contracts. And it's also about helping to develop our corporate, our corporate members, right? So mm -hmm. that they know how they have, what's the best practice look like for a robust supply chain inclusion? How do you really set up a, a strong supply diversity process that starts with your top leaders supporting it and them understanding why this is so important? How do you share the business case within your organization so that anyone who's making a buying decision knows how to include diverse suppliers as part of that process? So we spend a lot of time working with our supply diversity professionals as well, training them and educating them. The, the third area is really around our advocacy work. And I already talked a lot about that, making sure that there is a voice, a, a collective voice for our minority businesses. So, and again, we saw it very clearly with what happened in 2020. We had to work so closely with the White House as they were developing stimulus packages, the, the PPP loans and funding that was coming out. It was being created for small businesses, but we knew that there are special nuances that impacted minority suppliers. So how do we make sure that their voice is being heard? So that's another key around the work that we do is around the advocacy. And of course, the last one, which is really first, it's our certification. It is the gold standard. It mm -hmm. is the certification that helps get those businesses in the door that are 51% owned, operated, and controlled by minority or minority entities. We are the organization that has established the certification process that many other organizations built their processes upon because it is the foundation for how you are able to determine these firms truly are owned and operated by minority companies. And I can tell you that the Act One Group is very proud to carry the certification of NMSDC as well as a corporate plus membership, yes. which I'm gonna <laughs> ask you to talk about a little bit in a minute. Before I do though, you know, you talked about how NMSDC grew up from uh, infancy as a strong advocate for doing business. Um, corporates and diverse suppliers. Uh, the work that Harriet Michelle, Eric Vicioso, and um, I don't know if you are old enough to remember Ray Jensen from Ford. Oh, Mocha. yes. <laughs> yes, Ray. Ray helped train a lot of us in supplier diversity. I knew Ray Jensen, yes. I was so blessed to have been able to meet him before he retired as well and to learn at his knee. Um, here's, he, here's the question though for you. Um, you know, when, when NMSDC was doing business then, a lot of it was face-to-face -face interacting. You knew what somebody had for lunch because you could smell it. Um, today, NMSDC has had to grow. We've gone virtual, and yet somehow you've been able to uh, continue to improve programs, outcomes, and deliver results that are astounding. You continue to be a leader. How are you doing that? I'll tell you what has made the difference is the team that we have in place. Um, we are very, we're very fortunate that we have a number of folks that are working on the NMSDC leadership team that actually came from corporate America. They made that same sacrifice because they were so committed to the mission and the work of NMSDC to bring their corporate experience into a nonprofit organization. And a lot of nonprofits can't um, really have the ability to, to attract that level of talent because of our mission and the, the type of work that we do, we've been able to do that. So by having such a strong leadership team, they were the ones really out front coming up with innovative ways to, to pivot very quickly from a destination event to a virtual event, getting the right resources in. And then our board of directors giving us the support that we needed to get the right technology, the right um, infrastructure that we needed to be able to continue moving forward. And I think what was so important that everybody needed to understand and what they did understand, this was the most critical time for minority businesses because we saw the report that came out in May that over of the small businesses that went out of business, 40% were minority owned. 
And of that 40%, 60% by November said that they doubt that they would actually be able to go get back in business. So we knew that this was a, a critical juncture for minority firms, that we had to have this resource for them. We had to make sure that the work continued to move forward and we had to have ways to continue connecting them with corporate America. Their livelihood and our communities depended on it. Well, you know, thinking about you, a 10 year old uh, getting on a bus and being told not to come back because of the color of your skin. Um, thinking about how you left a really chummy position in corporate America to take on championship for a cause that you're so committed to. We are, when statistics in 2020, even if close to being a full aggregation, suggest those challenges still exist and are growing in some instances for uh, people of color. Um, how do you then, Adrian, inspire the young women who are listening to your voice right now, who are seeing you sitting here still passionate and committed? How do you talk to them about their opportunity and how they should be seeing? I'll tell you one thing I think is so inspiring and not necessarily for me, but just what's inspiring for all women right now is that when you look at the data, we're seeing more women entrepreneurs leave corporate America and start and take, take charge of their own destiny is what I call it. They're starting to say, if I can work in corporate America and be, have this level of success, then certainly I can do this on my own. And we see women businesses are the fastest growing segment of, of small businesses right now. And what I say to them is if you have something in your heart and you have a great idea or a great solution that you know can help another company be able to accomplish its goals, go for it. There are so many women entrepreneurs out here that are willing to mentor, to, to help um, support, to help provide resources, to help other women entrepreneurs be successful. And I think that's what speaks to so, which is so, which is so inspiring about the work that we do because again, it goes right back to those relationships and making sure that we at NMSDC continue to create a, an infrastructure that allows those relationships to be nurtured. We really put a lot of focus around our, our women of color initiatives last year for that particular reason. We saw that women entrepreneurs were the fastest growing segment. Our corporations were asking for this focus because they too saw that this was the fastest growing segment of the small business community and in fact, for those companies that are, those corporations that are consumer facing, they also understood the impact to their brand by having women entrepreneurs involved in their supply chain. I saw a study that showed that when you look at the household purchases made, that women influence 80% of those decisions. Mm -hmm. So if women are, are the main consumers out here and now they're now entrepreneurs, what a great, what, what better way for them to be a part of the overall economic system to say, how can I help contribute to the overall US economy with my ideas and, and, and my resources and my know-how, by also being able to engage and to drive outcomes as it relates to those corporations that are looking to do business with them. So there is a business case and a cycle that shows the interdependency upon corporate America to these women entrepreneurs and to these women entrepreneurs to each other. So to me, it's all interrelated work. And I'm just excited to be one of those conduits to help bring all the dots together to kind of make those connections happen and bring them to life. Well, wow, are you doing it? You're doing it every day. And you do it with such agility and such passion, yet you still maintain that, that sense of peace that when we look at you, we see calm and we see confidence. How did you gain that working in an environment that can for others feel quite hostile, Adrian? It has to be, for me, it's been my spiritual journey um, because you have to take care of yourself. And that's sometimes hard for us as women. We tend to take care of everyone else first and then put ourselves at the bottom of the list. And for me, you know, having that spiritual connection and being able to, to take a step back and to, to allow myself to connect with my creator and, and really work towards my work in my purpose, what, what my creator has for me makes a difference. Because when I know I'm working in that purpose 
and I'm doing his will, not my will, but his will, I'm protected. I am protected completely and there is no harm that can come to me no matter how much others may try because my destiny is determined not by anything or anyone on this earth. So to me, you can't have anything but peace when you know that you have that kind of covering, that kind of protection, that kind of support that comes from, that comes from a source that no man could possibly give you. So for me, that's what, that's, that's what drives me. When people look at me and they say, how do you do this? That's how. You know, you bring me back to something else you said. And if, look, family, if you don't know by now, I listen to everything Adrian says, okay? I learn and get better for it. I remember you once saying something to the effect of um, what's happening is real around, and this is long before COVID or long before January 6, 2021. 20, uh, you were saying, um, Look, I know it's real. A lot of stuff is happening out there, but you've got to make sure that you're in charge of what's happening in here, in your hearts. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be your cover when you go out there because you can educate your mind as much as you want to, but you were encouraging us that our hearts had to lead us. And then our minds were, were talk a little bit about that, Adrian. That's really been important to you in an environment where you are very data supported, data driven, and data defended. You're talking about the heart. And that's something, you know, especially when you're in a professional setting that some people aren't necessarily comfortable with simply because they just don't understand it or because it's not tangible, right? You can't, you can't touch it, you can't feel it. And to your point, we live in a society that is so data-driven and really, you know, really responsive to data, data points of, of, of information. We have to speak to things that are, that are driven from within. It's hard for people to sometimes understand that unless they too are on that same spiritual journey. So when I ask people, you know, because to me, it seems like, that's part of my calling as well, is to help people get to a place where they have that, that peace and that they can figure out ways that they can still be productive and be entrepreneurial in their thinking, but not but still be true to who they are. And that's something I think sometimes, I say this now because I'm a, I'm a woman of a certain age that maybe I may not have understood when I was a lot younger or earlier in my career. So if I could help someone learn that earlier in their career, and create environments where it's okay for that to be accepted. That to me is a part, another reason why I do the work that I do and why I convey the messages that I convey so that people can know that we need to create opportunities for, for people to feel comfortable with who they are and how they approach things that may be different than how someone else approaches it, but that doesn't necessarily make it wrong. It's okay. Well, and we I, have to keep that okay. You know, I've certainly witnessed that based on what suppliers say and how they grow in your organization. And, you know, I never told you this. Um, I've certainly witnessed how suppliers who come from different faith bases, uh, they may come from different uh, political persuasions, uh, certainly different cultures and languages. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard more than a few talk about how your good spirit guides them and gives them confidence in the organization, sometimes as much as some of the uh, actual programs they engage in, that listening to you, they wanna make sure if you're on the program, they're all in there. Um, does that, faith that you speak about, that spiritual uh, grounding that you speak from, does that help you to be that better listener? Because I wonder for myself, what is it that, that Adrienne herself is able to um, bring forward from that? And it occurred to me, maybe, maybe that spiritual peace that you have, that certainly fuels the passion, um, Maybe that's how you're a better listener for them. I don't know. What, what, talk about that for me. Is there anything there? It could be, but I'll tell you what I think people sense is that it's never about me. 
And I think that's what people, when they get the chance to sit down and talk to me, understand that what I'm doing is not about me. It's about mm-hmm. something much greater than me. And because of that, I do listen. And I'll tell you, there are times that I'm, I've actually been criticized because I'm not that beating on the table, yelling kind of leader that says, we got to do this or, you know, that's not my style. My style is more, more reflective. Let me listen, go back and come back with a solution. So, you know, and I would have folks say that and make comparisons to me and other leaders all the time saying, oh, she's too quiet. She's not being voiceful, voiceful enough. She's not being forceful enough. That style doesn't work for me. What works for me is, is, is being able to gather from others where the pain points are, where the, where the challenges are, so I can go back and come up with a better solution. There, and I, I mean, maybe it's something again that I, I got from my upbringing is that there's a reason why God gave us two ears and one mouth. <laughs> <laughs> because if you're talking all the time, you can't hear, you can't listen to <laughs> talking. So to me, there's a reason, and, and it is, it's something I've been told over and over that, you know, sometimes you might seem just a little too quiet. It's because I'm reflecting, I'm listening, and I'm taking in information so I can come back with a better solution. Well, whether we are whether we are male or female, however we identify, there's so much that you've done that I think we can learn from. And one area of that that um, that I really want you to have an opportunity to talk about is identifying what your own personal uh, mission is in life. Now, you were inspired very early on by circumstances that are not what any of us would want you turned it into fuel for you. Um, Talk with us about how we do that when we are in our early 20s and 30s. Because, you know, in my industry, I say, you're going to have a lot of jobs on the path to your career, maybe, you know, Uh, be ready for that. Everybody doesn't know jumping out, you know, of the gate, what they want to do. But can you talk with us about things you've learned that helped you to identify or know, or that you think more importantly will help others? So I think that, and some of it we've already covered, is it's really around knowing your purpose and trying to understand what your purpose is early enough. And, and I have uh, two daughters that are in their early 20s, and um, trying to help them understand that is, is, is kind of what's helping me to see, okay, how do we get this message better across to this next generation? This next generation is very different than the way we grew up and the, and the way that we pursued our careers. They have a much higher reliance on social media, social influencers. It's just a whole different way that they are conditioned versus how we were when we, when we were coming up through our generation. So what I try to help instill in this, in this next piece of this next group coming up is, okay, know your purpose, know that it's okay to take risks. Many of them are in better positions to take risks than, than at least I was when I was at that age, because I didn't have a safety net. You know, it was either if I didn't if I didn't hunt, I didn't eat. So a lot of times these folks have that that type of, of, of safety net that they could take advantage of. So I try to encourage you to take the risk. It's okay to fail. It's okay to hear no. You're gonna hear no hundreds of times. Get used to it early enough so that you know how to take it and how to respond to it because you're gonna hear no. And and so those are the types of things that I think is so important for these, particularly young women coming up, is to, to learn how to find their voice learn how to find their purpose and their passion and learn how to take care of themselves living through their purpose and their passion. And that's okay. And you're going to make some mistakes. You're going to have some missteps along the way. Dust yourself off, learn from them and keep moving forward. And I think that's what's kind of, that's the advice that I give my young people, my mentors that I work with. And that's what I think is going to help this next generation kind of find their way and find their path. Well, I know your daughters have heard lots of things said about you. Uh, I pray they listen to this podcast. And if you're listening, ladies, I have to tell you, when your mom walks into a room, especially those I've given personal witness to, she may walk in quietly, but everybody is waiting to listen to what she has to say. And your mom has done something, I think, that rises to the level of art, even as it comes authentically, I believe from her heart. And that is she she dares to tell the truth, even when it may not make new friends. The friends she has 
steadfastly support her because she does dare to tell the truth in the face of circumstances that simply not speaking might have been easier. And Adrienne, I say that with so much gratitude to you because today I think that's something that's really important. You realize that 70% more or less of the people under 30 who come into our offices virtually now um, have their own websites. Mm -hmm. That means they're very conscious of their branding. How they brand and what they're branding to isn't always the best thing. And we have to coach them to assure that the way they brand themselves or the way they presence themselves on social media is going to be very much in front of any conversation they're going to have with an employer or an investor. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? And not just women, men, you know, no, I was, you're this right. is it's gender both. neutral. This is gender inclusive. Absolutely. And it, it is something that I think we need to have more coaching around because in this era of social media where people put things on channels to get more likes or more shares. Sometimes it could be a little, you know, kind of a little out there. But I always tell folks, you have to think about once it's out there, it's out there, you can't get it back. And that is tied directly to your brand. So always be cognizant of what you're putting out there and the way that you're gonna be perceived. Is that the brand that you want when you start thinking about either the type of employment that you want to, want to one day achieve if you're going to become an entrepreneur, people are going to look at that, your brand, and tie that back into your services and, and decide if they want to even do business with you. All of that impacts who you are and what your brand is out in social media. And you can't just look at it as, oh, I got a thousand likes on this today. Are they the kind of, are they, is it the likes that really reflect who you are and what your brand is and what you want your brand to be? And I know there are probably a ton of, of sessions out there, coaching sessions to help these folks understand it. But I think it's incumbent upon us to really keep pushing in on that because they have to know that it can come back to haunt them if it's not done appropriately. And that's whether they're doing it in a personal way or if you're setting up their businesses and they Absolutely. think they've got some hot entrepreneurial idea, people are going to sell against what they put out there, aren't they? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And we have this... Um, group called um, Emerging Young Entrepreneurs at NMSDC, that we're bringing in the next generation of entrepreneurs to help train them in this very way. And there's a whole class around, a whole module around the social media and how to effectively use social media to position your brand and making sure that, you know, once you are out there as, a, as an entrepreneur, your brand is simultaneous with your, with your personal brand. You can't separate the two. So you have to understand that whatever you do, you can't say, well, here's my business brand and here's what I'm putting out on my business, but then have some things out on your personal brand that may not be reflective of what your consumers may want to, how they may want to engage with you. It's, it's all interconnected. So we have that module in place, particularly because they rely so heavily on it and being it virtual for this last, what, nine, 10 months has even encouraged that even more. So it's something we have to make sure that they're ready for and they, they take it seriously because we want them to be successful and they'd be surprised at how many people go onto their pages that they would never even know are on their pages, just looking at who they are as a person before they decide to do business with them. And I've actually had uh, representatives from some very, very major organizations, you referenced Fortune 50 companies uh, who we do business with, who have before giving us an opportunity, actually commented to me that they checked me out personally. They also have mentioned that uh, as clients, you know, they continuously check in to see what I'm doing. And it may be framed from a place of, oh, I just love following you because you're inspiring or, oh, you know, I like to see what you're doing. But the bottom line is I don't get to separate myself from my company and there's a responsibility as well as opportunity in that. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, um, you know, uh, Adrian. before we go to four, four for four, uh, there is one thing I wanna ask you about. We talked a lot about how you groom yourself uh, because um, you do have a fangirl following for that. But before, but before you, you ever, yeah, before you ever dress up though, 
you've taken care of yourself spiritually and physically as well. Talk with us a little bit about what your routine looks like for taking care of yourself. Um, you know, holistically, how do you, how do you eat? How do you exercise? Help us to understand uh, how Adrian gets to be Adrian. Well, I'll tell you, I'm not as disciplined as I like to be in that regard. Um, being home for these last, you know, several months has been very trying because I'm used to being on the go. I'm used to, you know, on airplanes, going through airports and getting all my exercise in various ways. But what I found is that you have to, you have to schedule it like anything else. If it's a priority for you, you make it happen. So when I am in that mode where I'm thinking, okay, my eating habits haven't been where they need to be. I've not been doing my normal hydration like I need to. How do I make sure that I build water in? I got to schedule everything just like I do with any other priority that I have. So when I get into that mode where I'm back in workout mode, it becomes a part of my schedule. I'm up at a certain time. I'm hitting my home gym at this time. I'm making my, I'm planning my breakfast out so that I make sure that I eat something healthy versus grabbing a muffin, which I know I shouldn't have. So you have to just plan it. For me, that's how I get disciplined around it until I feel that I'm back in the, the mode that I need to be where I'm being more conscious about eating healthy, drinking water, taking breaks like I need to, standing up and getting, you know, instead of sitting in front of a computer all day, making sure that I'm, I'm being more, more agile in terms of getting my daily walks in, things like that, I have to schedule it. And so if I don't schedule it, it won't get done because your day, as you know, it just gets so out of control. You have all these different things you're trying to do. So if, if I want to make sure that I stay healthy and stay, you know, in shape because you know I've been married 28 years now going on 29 years and and I like that my husband gives me a second look when I walk in the room so that feels good to me and I want to make sure he continues to do that so when I'm out of my discipline that's how I get back in and schedule it so I make sure it happens well you know that's something that I think uh the two things you and I I think have in common uh one is I I simply put it discipline ain't a dirty word I don't mind the discipline of it. You know, I know discipline kind of feels restraining or, you know, argumentative to some people, but I've always embraced the outcome that discipline can offer you. And so I find strength and promise in discipline. And I see that you do as well. I mean, coming from a place where you know you're spiritually good and you can be at peace with people and you can have friends across different uh, different disciplines because of the peace and the, and, and the spiritual uh, comfort you have. I, I'm i such a fan. I'm such a fan. Let's put, go four for four, okay? Well, it's mutual. The feeling is mutual. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, 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 and let me just pause one moment before we go four for four to share this with you, Adrian. You know, um, I've said this several times, and I'm sure you've articulated or heard it yourself a lot lately. Never before has the world been so solely engaged in solving for the same solution at the same time that you bring such a light in the midst of this pandemic and a calm and a purpose um, is so promising to so many people for all of us who are members of NMSDC, whether we be corporate members, corporate plus members, or supplier members, I just really extend you a, a huge, huge moment of gratitude for that. I cannot overstate that you would step forward and lead an organization because of the passion you have for what that organization does and being prepared to um, being prepared to leave a lot of security behind to do that. Uh, the many conversations you have and the nights that you stay up planning and then still showing up by day as if you've had a full eight hours. Um, for all of that, we thank you. We thank you for that. So thank you, thank you for that. Here's to you. Uh, we're going to go four for four. So. Um, you know that I'll, I'm going to ask you four questions and you're going to give me four answers to each question and the reason for each of those answers. And I can hardly wait to go with you. First question, 
Adrian, you get to have a dinner. You're hosting this dinner party and you can have any four guests from any time in history or present you wish. Who's at your table? So my four would be, of course, it's gonna be two people. Barack and Michelle Obama would have to be at the table. Um, the third person would be Mae Jemison, not Mae Jemison, um, not Mae Jemison. Um, the third person would be, I would have to say Oprah, although I've had the opportunity to talk with Oprah, it'd have to be Oprah. Um, and the, the last one would be Zora Neale Hurston. Zora Neale Hurston. Yeah, so, yeah. Wow. That's the first time Zora Neale Hurston has shown up. So tell us why those four people. So for Michelle, Barack and Michelle Obama, obviously, you know, being our, our, our first Black family in the White House is just significant. But they are just good people. They are just really good people and fun people and real people, authentic people. And I love being around folks like that who can be so wildly successful, highly successful, and still just be real. Just, just real. I've had the opportunity. They're going to go on and eat, right? They're going to eat. Exactly, exactly. You know, and have great conversation and just to hear their <laughs> stories over the years. It would just be phenomenal to hear that. Um, and in Oprah, COVID, they'll probably help wash the dishes. Exactly, too, huh? right. I can see Michelle doing that. Like, no, you sit yeah. down, you cooked, I got this. So yeah, so that'd be fantastic for me. Um, with Oprah, because of her business sense. I mean, she has just owned her brand from day one. She has owned it and she is not apologetic about it. Mm -hmm. And, so I and you know, I think she had a great friendship with Maya Angelou. Mm -hmm. I, I almost a sisterhood there. Uh, I don't know how they identified their relationship. I'm sure I can scan back and hear her actually say how she would identify it. But what came across for me is that she seemed to have really taken so many of um of the lessons Maya taught and mm -hmm. then evolved it forward and presented yeah. it to a whole new generation and a wider audience. Did you, don't you get that? I mean, I love her. Yes, when she did the WW tours last year, I was fortunate to go to one of them when she had it here in Dallas. And you were absolutely right. A lot of what she talked about came from the, the, information in the, the discussions and the conversations that she had with Maya Angelou. And she talked about that. And, and when she speaks of that, you could just hear a pin drop because everyone is just listening to, to that wisdom. And to me, I would love to just have my own quiet session with her to hear those, those inner thoughts and how it has made her just so comfortable with owning her own brand the way that she has. And you know, should. oftentimes, you're right, oftentimes, you know, you, you, you pull a word or a name and you throw the anagram uh, uh, essence to it. With Oprah, I always think ownership. She takes ownership for who yeah. she is. You know, she doesn't blame anybody else. She doesn't curse anybody else. She takes ownership for it. And P, she's very personal. You can be one of a thousand in an audience and you still feel the personal connection she has to you because she speaks from a personal place, which I think is a part of that ownership. And then the R is the reasoning. She asks the reason why. She also wants reason and solution, you know? Yeah. Um, and then the attitude for the A. Um, you know there were times in her career where she had to have come to that stage or to that mic down, but she always brought an attitude of H, hope. You don't listen to Oprah. You don't, um, you don't experience anything she does without leaving full of hope, you know? And, 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 and I think of her that way way well I'm going to serve at that dinner because I want that experience as well <laughs> exactly. yeah yeah mm. and then for Zora Neale Hurston just the, the the ability to be able to capture our culture our stories that resonate over generations 
it's just to me such a powerful ability to 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 to, to capture that voice, to speak that voice, and and that the 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 teachings that she had in a in such a um, artful way is just she's one of my favorite all time favorite authors, and I would just love to just hear didn't her. Didn't she art. do? Didn't she do some darn? Hey, hey, Adrian! Didn't Zora Neale Hurston do some journalistic work down in Florida that she got? She didn't get the opportunity to actually evolve from, but she 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 did journalistic work as well, didn't she? I don't remember hearing that specifically, um, but you may be right because I, I'm going to do my homework. Yeah, yeah, I would love to know that as well. But she's just her her teachings through our culture. It's just it feels like she just captures our our soul. And she can she can articulate it in such an artistic artistic way that it's just just peaceful for me. It's very peaceful for me. Well, girl, don't you worry about asking Michelle to help you with those dishes. <laughs> I'll do the dishes. Let me come serve at that dinner because you got you got quite a dinner party going on. Exactly. Uh, I can hardly wait to find out what would you serve. What would you serve at that dinner? So what I would serve, of course, we're gonna have we're gonna have the good food and not so good food. So I don't know if you remember the movie Soul <laughs> Food, when you had the big long platter of food to choose from, that's my ideal dinner table. So you could have the, the nice fried food if you want to have a little piece of that. Of course, you got to have, you know, the greens and the, the sweet potatoes and the corn. And, and then you have the more, you make more healthy food, like the salmon and things like that. So it's going to be a variety. It's going to be a nice long table with all kinds of just good food. And, and, and you, you're going to have Barack at one end and Michelle at the other so he can eat. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, girl. Oh, yeah. That sounds wonderful. I, I wouldn't expect any less from you. That sounds so <laughs> wonderful. Let's go two for four. Let's go two for four. Okay. Um, tell me um, what you're listening to and why I'm talking music now. Mm -hmm. So every morning I get up, I turn my Alexa music on to Mary Mary radio on Pandora. And I listen to Mary Mary because it's the upbeat gospel music that kind of just gets me going. It's just so inspirational, so motivational yeah. that that kind of helps set my day. So that's my, my daytime music. And then when I go to work out. Hey, you know what? Let me tell you something real quick. Let me tell you something real quick about Mary Mary. There was a moment prior, uh, and I'm not talking about August 2nd, uh, which, you know, is the day my uh, husband, my beloved of over 40 years passed away. I heard you mention 29 years of marriage. And I was like, yeah, you know, to be able to be loved fully and completely and in something that was a wonderful journey that you knew you know, we were together for forever. Um, on August 2nd, that ceased for me. But before then, I had an occurrence that was really deep for me. And Mary Mary saying yesterday. Mm -hmm. And yesterday brought me through to a lot of tomorrows and got me here today. So I just want to take a moment in your acknowledgement of them to shout out that, yeah, they do a lot of upbeat, but yesterday is one of the most poignant songs you can hear. It's also a very teaching song, isn't it, Adrian? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Absolutely. It, so that, it proclaims hope and moving yes. forward, doesn't it? it? Moving forward, drying those tears and just going, you know, have a good cry and let it go. <laughs> Yeah, those sisters helped me. Yes. Who else you listen yes. to? So then when I go to get my workout on, I'm listening to Jay-Z and Beyonce because they, they, they uplift me and motivate me in another way. <laughs> they keep me grounded in terms of who I really am inside. So that's my go-to. So I listen to those two. And it's, it has to be both of them. I don't listen to just Jay-Z mm -hmm. and I don't listen to just Beyonce. I like them as the Carters. That's my favorite mm -hmm. genre of, uh, of hip hop music. That's what I go to them and listen mm -hmm. to them. And then your other two. My other two that I listen to. So then if depending on my other move, I'm more reflective, just kind of trying to, you know, think through some things. Jill Scott's my go-to. Got to go to Jill. Oh. Jill, Jill puts it in perspective for me as well. Love me some Jill Scott. 
she could just help me. And she acts the way she sings, doesn't yeah. she? When she when you see her, she acts the way she sings. She I does. mean, it's real. It's got it's earth real. and elegance, doesn't it? Yes, 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 yes. So that's my third go-to. And then I would say my last one would be, I'm old school. So I will usually turn my Pandora on to 80s or 90s hip hop. And oh then I'll just goodness. hear various artists from Tupac, he's another one of mine, to Biggie, to Mary J. Blige. I go back to my, to my 80s and 90s and I was coming up uh, and really learning who I was as a person. Girl, after COVID, we're going to have to get together. We're going to have to eat, listen to music. Uh -huh. <laughs> hey, okay, let's go three for four. Thank you. I know you've inspired a lot of people. They're probably going to go <laughs> listen now, right? They're going to be asking you for your playlist. Yeah. Uh, but uh, three for four, what books are you reading or that you've read that you're going to share with the uh uh, family that you think they should be reading and why for so for the first one is and I go back to this book all the time it's called the first 90 days I'm terrible with authors so I can't think of who the actual author is but the first 90 days really is a leadership book that helps you understand when you're going into any new situation new job how do you acclimate yourself how do you learn the business how do you learn the people learn the customs learn the norms the, the culture all of that, and it really helps you. And it's not just about that new experience, but for me, it's even ongoing lessons of leadership in terms of how to continue navigating through challenges that you may come up with, with that you're not necessarily familiar with. So the first 90 days has been my go-to book. There's just so many life lessons in there. The second one is, I actually just pulled it back out. It's probably sitting over there on my bookshelf right now, is uh, uh, Good to Great. That book, oh, just, yeah. you can just read that over and over and over because of all of the just the key lessons in it about ways that you can just reinvent your business or reinvent yourself. And I always take those books that, that go beyond just one dimension of whether it's around entrepreneurship or just your career. There are different things that you can learn from it. So that's another key one of mine. You know, a friend customer of mine recommended that book to me yes. and he was so kind in Colorado we were at dinner and uh in Boulder Colorado and he said I see the work you're doing and I see the passion you have for your work I met him at NMSDC he said uh -huh. I see the work you're doing and um he wanted to share with me a book he thought would help me in that journey from good to great by the way family for Adrian's full list, her playlist, and her reading list, you can go to Ask JBH. I'm going to be posting her stuff there. Adrian, I'm going to share with them that as well as Good. how to get in touch with you at NMSDC. So the first 90 days, first 90 Good days, great. Yep. Um, and then my two? third one is uh, again, I have to give you the, the author, but it's called The Power of Habit. So how do you really understand things that you should be doing that can really help instill just, it really helps to change behaviors that you want to really focus on. It's like, how do you really turn those behaviors into who you are as a person? So it goes beyond just a habit, but really about your integrity, your culture and who you are as a person. So that's my third one. And then I always go back to the, the one that I, that I haven't read yet, but I'm pulling it out. It's uh, President Obama's latest um, uh, book, um, about what's it called? Our promises. I can't remember the name of it. But. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's been on several people's reading lists yeah, lately, on reading and list. on several of my guests' reading lists as well. Uh, so again, I'm going to be posting that on Ask JVH, uh, Adrian. I mean, you know, when I think about the four books that you're recommending, each of them are so teaching and so giving to someone who's ready to receive wisdom. That's just incredible. Thank you so much. Absolutely. I'm, I, I'm always a constant student of learning. Um, you have to continue to learn and understand ways that you can improve, that you can develop, that you can grow. It's a journey. It's, 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 it's never ending. So how do you continue to keep your mind exposed to that? And it, it's so hard in this, in this day and age because there are so many distractions out there, whether it's work or whether it's um, just when you try to take some time to just decompress and you turn on the Netflix and you try to just let your mind kind of relax a little bit, but you got to stay hungry. And that's what I always try to do. I try to stay hungry for knowledge.
Mm, well, that segues us beautifully into four for four. I'm going to, I want you to share four of the lessons you've learned that have been taught you or that you've curated yourself uh, that you believe this particular family can grow and learn from. So I think it goes back to the lessons that my mom instilled in me at a very young age. And that is that the first is you can do anything you set your mind to as long as you come up with a good plan and learn how to execute it. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible, especially if it's if you're working according to the will that your creator has in you, whoever your creator may be. But if you know your purpose and you know that that's the will, nothing is impossible. So that's one. The second is that it's okay. And this is one. I, this is one I just learned probably in the last year. It's okay to say no mm -hmm. with no explanation. Wow! That's, wow! <laughs> that's hard for me because I, I am. I'm, I'm always that person that wants to help, wants to support, wants to please. It's okay to say no <laughs> with no with no explanation. explanation. Whoa! <laughs> Uh, you know, you remind me of when I was growing up and if dad or mom would say no, especially dad and daddy, but why? Because I said so. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you need. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> you took me home with that. Yes, yeah, so that would be the second one. The third one is that um, it's okay to fail. You know, we sometimes are, we, we become risk averse because we don't want to fail. And we think we look at failure as, as this really huge, this horrible thing, but really it's not. Failure is a way of learning. It's a way of growing. It's a way of saying, okay, don't do that again. You won't know unless you try it. So to me, getting comfortable with knowing that you might fail, but that's okay. You learn from it and you move on. I think that's another key lesson that I'm, that I'm getting more comfortable with because I too was the same way coming up in my career. I may have played it probably a little safer than I would today because I've got more comfortable saying, you know what? Public failure, it's okay. It's a lesson learned because, you know, life goes on, things go on. I love what you on. said. I mean, hashtag Adrian says, failure is just another way of saying, don't do that again. <laughs> wow. Wow, I love that. We're getting some, oh, this is rich. Yes. And I would say my last one would be, um, if I had to think of one more, and again, I'm trying not to think of the ones that um, I give my kids, I give it to them all the time. But my last lesson would be um, just take time for yourself. Be selfish. Be selfish. And when you are a giving, nurturing person, that too can be very difficult. But if you can't, if you aren't good to yourself, you can't be good to others. And if you want people to get the best of you, you gotta, you got, you have to nurture that best of you from within. So that'd be my last one: is understanding ways that you can just take care of yourself, focus on you. Self care is important for you to be able to be good to other people. Whew. Beautiful, beautiful, Adrian. You have shared your anointing with us. I say anointing because the lessons that you taught even in such a friendly, comfortable, casual conversation are dynamic. They are powerful, intentional, and I would guess hard earned. So mm. thank you so, so much. Um, you gotta come back. You just gotta Absolutely. Come back. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Okay. And listen, in the meantime, from my heart to your home, God bless. Thank you. Stay safe through this pandemic and keep leading us. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. I'm here to serve.